All right, here we go. We've got the thumbs up to get this started. Um, hey everyone, my name is Andy Kelly. I'm the SVP of podcasts at iHeartMedia. Uh, and it's been a wonderful week. I want to thank you all for sticking around on Friday. I think what they did differently this time on Friday was have uh, a bunch of really the poignant conversations that, uh, that, that need to be had. And I think that that's what we're doing today is we're going to be discussing a topic that's, in my opinion, grossly overlooked in the podcast medium. Um, to date, our medium has been largely driven by English-led podcasts. Uh, I would say that it's been dominated by uh, English-speaking podcasts. Um, but as our industry grows and we're reaching a larger and larger international audience every day, the big question becomes, how many listeners are we missing out on by not offering these shows in native languages around the globe? Inversely, how many amazing shows are we missing out on by not having those in English? And so what we're here to discuss today is the aptly named Reaching Podcasting's Next Billion Listeners, which may sound like a little bit of hyperbole, but if you think about the tools and the technology and the creativity and the talent that is surrounding this idea, I think that reaching those billion listeners is actually more of a near-term thing than, than you might consider. One of the major themes of podcast movement this week has been audience development. And uh, this is audience development on a global scale. This is audience development on steroids. And so what we've done is assembled an amazing group of panelists here that will give you a glimpse into what we're doing now and what's coming in the near term so that we can reach that global audience, those next billion listeners. Uh, so let's, uh, I'll just start it out from, I guess, your left to right. Uh, we'll go with Drew Hillis, SVP, Global Sales and Commercial Enterprise at Veritone. If you don't know, Veritone is the leader in enterprise AI software services and applications. Uh, next, we've got Rebecca Dalby, who is the head of marketing at Spreaker from iHeart. Very excited. Uh, Spreaker is an international leader in podcast hosting, monetization, and ad tech. Um, next, we have got, uh, sorry, uh, Andy Lipset, CEO of Spoken Layer, in the, uh, the leader in creation, distribution, and monetization of short form audio content. Uh, then we've got David Meltzer, co-founder of Sports One Marketing and formerly served as the CEO of renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency. And rounding it out, we've got Brian Barletta, who I'm sure you all know, uh, but founder of Sounds Profitable, a weekly newsletter you may have has come across your inbox. Um, uh, it's a podcast advertising technology newsletter from, you know, the one of the most renowned podcast uh, uh, network. So let's dive in. Actually, Rebecca, I wanted to start with you um, just to kind of give the audience an idea of what are we, you know, what, what is the industry doing to stimulate podcast content outside of the US right now? Where, where are we at? How are we engaging audiences on a global scale? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um, well, I can speak really to what we're doing at Speaker from My Heart. Um, and one of the things that we're really trying to do is to enable growth through monetization in those markets because you know creators really you know creators can can create more content when they're seeing monetization and I know that it's not on the levels that we're seeing in the US yet but we're really trying to you know fill that demand wherever wherever we can and so um, we're working really hard our team at Spreaker to uh, work with DSPs and other agencies internationally not just in the US um, in order to stimulate that economy there and encourage more creators because when creators are creating, enabled to create more content, then it inspires others to do the same as well. So um, that's something that we work on actively. So kind of going into that, how should creators be thinking about creating content for a global audience? Um, I can, Andy, if you want to take this one, if you're creating content these days, how can you harness that global audience? Yeah, I, I, th um, I think that whether it's an international audience or just domestically, like, the formula shouldn't be different. You know, we come at it 
uh, as, a, as a creative force, um, thinking about the impact that sound can make, uh, the intimacy of the medium, and to me, whether it's in English or any other language, like those are the things you need to think about, right? We think about the impact that sound can make, and how do you do something and create something in an authentic voice? And if you're doing that, you build audience. If we're talking about audience and, and building audiences, that's the way to do it, right? It's through great content. So um, that's the way we think about it, whether it's you know, in English language or any other language. Like, to me, that's the formula. That's the secret sauce. Is there a level of listenership where someone should be considering more of that global audience? Is this someone who has 10 domestic listeners and saying, oh, maybe my content will resonate in a different market globally? Sort of what, who, who is this applicable to from the content creation standpoint? Can I dive into that? Yeah. No. I, Sans probably has 300 downloads for the English podcast per episode, right? And I have two Spanish language podcasts. One is Synthetic Voice that gets 100 downloads an episode, right? But we translate it with Veritone, which is very cool, and they use my synthetic voice, and we put it out there, but it's leading by example. Like, that's the really important part. And the other one's the download, which one of the hosts said to me, they're like, I speak Spanish. Can we do this? And yeah, I just we hired another host who spoke Spanish. We du duplicated the content. We, I'm paying twice as many people to do it, but it's, it's leading by example, and that's 300 downloads a week, and people comment on it. People see it and they realize they can do it. It's accessible at any size. It's not, it doesn't break the bank. Can I add to that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a little bit bigger podcast, um, <laughs> but I started with 300 downloads um, as well. But I think people are missing the idea of frequency and content uh, like you suggest. So this vibration or frequency of sound, uh, your frequency is your neighborhood. So think about it in the respect of if I live in a place where there's 300 people and I have my own personal essence, let's say I'm Dr. Pimple Popper because I'm not a big fan of pimples being popped, but if she lived in Knoxville, Indiana and she had this great passion for popping pimples, she would be an incredible ostracized failure. But you talk about over a billion people internationally, it's going to be more than that. Because what you're missing is that when you start, you should have a strategy of four things. One, capture your frequency. First, know your frequency, which is a whole nother subject. But capture your frequency, modify it to as many people as you can, and then amplify it. And then it becomes perpetual, and then it builds upon itself. So your 300 becomes 600, 1200, 2400. It's just a matter of time. And the better you are at it, the faster it'll occur. So why Veritone is so important to me is that not only in the capture, in the duplicative duplex of a conversation, and they can do both people in 33 different languages, all they're doing is increasing the size, scope, and scale of my frequency and my neighborhood so that I have a statistical success of having more people that are going to resonate with me. Because 10% of the people, of 7.6 billion people, no matter what you say, are going to love you. It's a matter of frequency. I could sit here, literally, I speak around the world, I stand on a stage and I could say, the, 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 and we could have 100 people here, and 10 people would come up to me and go, oh my God, Dave Meltzer, you're a genius. I love what you do, the way you taught us patience and redundancy. Like, I literally could do that. And 10%, no matter what I say, I could spout physics, metaphysics, and quantum physics that change the world. 10% are going to hate me. They'll be like, that dude's like Tabasco in a room. But the 80% that Veritone gives to us of 7.6 billion people, not just on the podcast, but on the post-production content that can be amplified by modification, becomes exponential beyond anybody's belief. And if you don't get this, whether you're starting or you have a top five podcast in the world, you're missing out because why would you limit your neighborhood? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's something we learned from Google, right? The power of scale is incredible. So if you're not thinking internationally, because the tent is not North America anymore, the tent is the world. The world's becoming smaller. So what are you doing to capture that international audience? Google made the power of scale famous, and I think that's what we can, that's the next billion listeners is the rest of the globe. But Drew, to follow up on that, 
how is technology going to impact scale? What, what is out there right now? What can we give the audience insight to into how we're going to reach that global audience? Uh, it's a good question. That's really exciting because I think that's what's going to, you said steroids, and I think technology is going to be the steroids. So um, it's, it's incredible that I think, number one, as everybody knows in this room, uh, con media consumption and distribution has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And we actually need technology to keep up with that and actually extend our brands and to be powerful across, across the globe. Uh, I think both in long form and in short form, I think synthetic voice can help us extend. These guys mentioned translation. Spanish is the number one language in the world. Why not clone their voices and translate to do Spanish to reach the Spanish audiences? But not just in long form and in short form. This is where I think we can really blow the listenership up. How much text, text is out there on the internet that should be audio? Everybody here knows the power of audio. It's so engaging. Uh, if you talk about the, the, the visually impaired, you know, to all the new audiences you can reach. So I think synthetic voice, translation, you know, in over 250 voices to bring these guys, these brands, incredible content to the world. The, the world is so small now, so now the tent is the world. And so I think technology can help with that. Also, I think this, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about brand safety and brand suitability. I'm a huge believer in that. This is an un unregulated industry. Uh, it's not like the FCC, it's not like linear, and it's the Wild West. And I really believe we're still in the start of the dial-up phase, honestly. Um, we have a lot of big brands, a $2 billion space. We have a lot of big brands sitting on the sideline waiting for it to be safe. There's no safe harbor. So I think Again, technology, brand suitability, brand safety technology to allow the big, brand, big brands to lean in. Now I think once we get big brands leaning in, you know, you guys kick in, you start monetizing. Google again made the long tail famous. This era reminds me of back in the web when everybody had a website, everybody's got a podcast. We need to learn how to monetize that, amplify that across the globe. You know, I think um, before I say anything, I want to say the, the, the. I'm going to use that. Um, he does it much better than I do. Um, that was the short form version of it. Um, I think, you know, when, when we're talking about scale, that's something that creators internationally have to think about for sure. But again, I, you know, go back to the authenticity, right? And, and one of the things, and Drew and I were just talking about this, and, you know, we're, we'll go down the path with Veritone, uh, you know, in terms of translation of, of our um, content. But, I, you know, the concern that I would have as a content creator internationally is just making sure that there's translation and there's transcreation, right? And making sure that the tone and the intent of the content remains authentic. And that's what I started saying before, right? It's that authenticity. You know that people can sniff that out. They will be out as soon as they, you know, sniff that anything is not real. And so I think there's that fine balance, right, between the scale, but also making sure that this comes across as the real deal. The, the, the technology is awesome, and I'm, I'm such a big fan of it. The fun part about podcasting is a lot of the tech we have, you could just throw 100 people at it and accomplish it manually. We're in a cool space, but the tech is becoming more efficient. The thing that I would say is we're, we're also in a really interesting time. We're bundling podcasting and video sales, and we're demanding the same price for these things. What we need to do with this is demand the same price in different languages. The reason we don't see this adoption, because we can do it with people. You can go on Fiverr and you can have someone translate it and read it for you. I, I like the ease of this solution. I like exploring the other solutions. But until someone doesn't discredit the value of my non-English inventory because they decide that that person listening to it has less buying power because we're mostly a DR-based industry, that's going to be the tipping point. And all of the agencies and everybody selling and everybody representing themselves, you got to draw that line. Because when we do that, when we say my English audience converts like this and look like this, and my Spanish audience resonates with them, and because of that, you should treat them the same, and they have that same buying power and levity, like, uh, that's, that's the tipping point we have to get to. Could I talk about one paradigm shift? Because this is the short, right, idea that people don't get uh, blessed to be around some great podcasters like Gary V and Tom Bilyeu and Ed Milet, and we get together a lot to talk about this. If you look at the top people right now, it's because they're only concerned about community. And what Veritone does 
is it allows you to build a community. Everybody's so worried. I, I, I run into people I mentor all the time. They have like 300 downloads. And they're like, well, how can I make money? Because most people can't afford to invest in themselves. And so they're just worried about how much they can make off their 300 subscribers. Right? That's, if, that's terrific, right? But that's not what we're talking about up, up here. When you're talking about the backlog of huge companies that are gonna get involved in this, in web one, web two, I've experienced myself since 92. If you build a community, it will never be cheaper than today or less expensive than today to build your community. And if you're not utilizing the voice to text and then the authenticity, I will tell you from someone who uses Veritone that I tested it out by playing it to my wife and pretending as if I uh, spoke it. And she's like, you don't know Spanish that well. And I said, no, I, I, I don't. She goes, oh, you read that? I said, no. She goes, come on. Then I knew it was if my own wife, who I've been married with 25 years, couldn't see a difference, now I was ready to utilize it outside. But build a community. That's all you should be focused in on today. You'll thank me tenfold 10 years from now. Hey, I just want to be clear. This is not a Veritone commercial. <laughs> no, just, I am. They, they, I am. I'm an authentic really, Veritone commercial. It I, changed my entire vision. I'm really sincere about that. This is not what I want. I want to talk about this topic. They just happen to use our product, and it, and it, Get it too is excited. good. There's no question. What we do is we ingest their, um, we've cloned their voices, right? So you should go listen to them. It's, cra it's great. Um, and then we've cloned them in, so they can speak Spanish. They don't know a lick of Spanish, but what we do is we ingest their podcasts, we transcribe it, we translate it, and then we push it through our, our voice, synthetic voice model, in the Brian Barletta and Dave's Spanish voice, so he, they do their podcast in Spanish, they release their podcast to the Spanish market. Both so it's, voices too. Both voices, right, exactly. Yeah. So I'm sincere, it's not a Vanertone commercial, they just use our product, so thanks but guys. Just to follow up on that, Real deal. how do you ensure the authenticity and that that's being received at the same level as it say would in the English version? So Brian, you say like, yeah. look, you gotta charge the same for the English as you do the Spanish, how, how do you know that that audience is receiving it in the same way as your native language? We have a hole in podcasting and it's, it's very clear this event. We don't have creative agencies that make ads and that make that like that tone, like look at those pieces. And that's kind of what the Spanish content for me is. It's an ad that I can do this, that I'm out there and doing that. And like what I like about what Andy does is like that's like they have to build that creative content. They're a creative shop. They have all these tools and they can do it. These tools need operators, and we need to train them. The idea of synthetic voice, and Andy, I'm really excited to hear more as you dig into those tools. You have a team that can create unique local language content, but you also are gonna have a team that are gonna become experts in using this like an instrument, changing the tone and pitch of certain things. If you just do it flat, it passes. It, 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 gets you there, it's good enough. But the next step forward is it's an instrument. We need editors, we need experts on it, and that's the human touch. These things get you 80% of the way there. That 20% is all new jobs, right? Someone to double check that the translation is correct, that the localization is correct, right? Someone to make sure that the inflection on certain words are, are, are there, and someone to listen to the feedback and figure it out. That's, that is a whole new set of jobs enabled by this. It doesn't replace people because there's room for both, just what the person wants to pay for. But I think that that's the, the crux of this whole thing. Well, one, understanding what technology is available and out there to get to the 80%. If you have a show or oversee a slate of shows or thinking about building more shows, where do you start in ensuring you can get to the finish line of that last 20%? What's the, how do you do that? I, I think that's it. I mean, that's Andy, because you're designing the shows. Like, I talk on a microphone, and thankfully these people do cool things with it, but like, you're designing the intent every day with new clients, so it's the planning phase, right? It's the planning phase, it's making sure that, you know, you're doing what's right by the listener again, and what's gonna resonate with the listener. And to me, this is not any different than any other medium, right, where, you know, you program, you program for the consumer. You program, in this case, for the listener. Um, you do a lot of research around that. You use some gut. 
um, you know, both from a science and art standpoint, and you figure out what's right. Um, that programming is one side of it, right? Putting the listener first is the way we think about a lot of our programming and the, and the content that we, that we create. But at the end of the day, it's also around that authenticity. We know the impact that sound can make. We understand that and we want to make sure that because of that, that listeners are taking that authenticity and going with it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was just going to say it's probably one of the most important things, right? I mean, that you guys have worked so hard to build your brands, you can't lose sight of that authenticity. So how much Q, human QC is involved to, to maintain that? Super important. Yeah. I, Re Rebecca, something I'm, I want to ask you related to all this, like, and, and maybe you don't have the numbers on, or an idea on the top of your head, but what you guys do is you provide monetization for podcasters on this. And I'm sure you're seeing some synthetic voice on there versus, you know, natural language, like, are you seeing that authenticity dictate who's making more money? Like, are, are you seeing that people who are speaking that language natively versus synthetic voice are finding it easier to be monetized because it's more genuine? Or what, like, what's the impact on monetization between using technology and, and hiring a person? I would say we're not seeing it yet in terms of the difference between synthetic versus real person's voice. Um, I think we're in earlier stages than that, to be perfectly honest with you. I think we're seeing what you were talking about earlier on with regards to normalizing this as a thing. I think, you know, we're not going to be able to go forward with this at scale unless everybody is doing it and it becomes um, something necessary in order to scale. So at the moment, we're actually just kind of trying to work on the education piece around how important it is to be available in different languages. And also in terms of monetization, we can't forget how important it is is for foreign podcasts to grow their audiences in the US as well. I mean, look at how many Spanish speakers there are in the US. It's incredible. Um, and we see so much growth in terms of monetization with Spanish speaking podcasts who focus on the US to grow their audiences and then get great success. We have an amazing example of a network we work with in, in LADAM who are getting 60% of their revenue from 6% of their audience that's based in the US. It's all Spanish speaking. And that just shows you the power of what we can do here if more podcasts are translated. And Rebecca, to follow up on that, let's talk trends really quickly. What are you seeing in terms of the biggest markets outside of the US? Where is podcast listening accelerating around the globe? Well, not to be repetitive, but again, LADAM is one because it's, you know, the sheer size of the audience that's available to Spanish speakers or people who understand Spanish. I think it's 14% of households are Spanish speaking first in the US at the moment. And so um, that's naturally been where we've seen growth in terms of emerging markets, but also uh, in terms of places within Europe as well. We've got Italy, Spain. Um, there's lots of really exciting things happening and we're really trying to stimulate those markets in terms of inspiring creators to keep creating and create more content. And of course, a tool that we use to do that is to provide them revenue. Because Brian said before, it's not fair if they're not getting paid the same amount of money and at the moment they're not. Um, and the, those monetiz monetization is not international yet at all. Um, I don't mean to harp on about monetization, but I really do think it's one of the keys in this situation. For well, sure. that's what's going to drive it. Absolutely. I mean, that's going to be the incentive to do it. And I want to get a little bit more specific on how you tailor content for an international audience. It's not necessarily one-to-one -one with U.S. listenership. So if you have a show, Andy, that's an hour long here, very popular program, very popular podcast, how would you think about tailoring that for a Latin audience? Well, uh, we're in the short form space, so uh, what we're going to do is take that and make it three minutes. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I mean, it, it does for our for the way we think about it, um, because we are in the short form business and we, we define short form as anything from three to six minutes in length. We don't see the difference in terms of consumption habits and engagement. Uh, any different in the United States than it is, you know, internationally. The fact is, is that you know, time is collapsing everywhere. Attention spans are collapsing everywhere. And so, whether it's here or anywhere across the world, like the things that we're going to think about first in terms of audience development and developing um, audiences that way are going uh, on the shorter side. Just in terms of what you're excited about, and this is for anyone in the group. Uh, any markets outside of LATAM that 
you're seeing some popular programs, popular podcasts coming out of, um, particularly Brian, like what, what do you see from feedback from Sounds Profitable? Because when you push something out, it reaches a much broader audience than just folks in the United States. Any international feedback that would be helpful for content creators in the United States to know about? Like, sad to say on that end, everybody who's touching the money speaks English. It, and if, it feels bad, yeah. right? Like the people that are making the decisions are all, they're all fluent in English, they wanna communicate in English. Um, I mean, the ad spend, when you think about the ad spend on those things, like the people in the United States that are managed, or the people that are managing podcast budgets for advertising and all those things are either podcast only and cover globally, or at a company so small that they handle all of marketing, and both of those people are in the United States. And so, even the people outside of the US, they're speaking English, they're engaging in English. I'm not getting pushed for more of that. I'm not getting asked for it. But, I mean, as recently as 2012, there was a radio, or there was a, a phone line you can call into in India. It was 50 minutes of content, 23 minutes of it, it was advertisements, and people would like ride their bikes to the local convenience store, listen to this like 800 number, and, and just consume it. Audio consumption is low in the US compared to the rest of the world. I think we got lapped by the UK, Edison said that, uh, UK or Australia beat yeah. us on that. I went over to Radio Days Europe and um, uh, Denmark has 80% of their population listen to audio. It's, we're, we're not it. We're, it seems like there's a, there's a, a huge disconnect yeah. then in our own feedback loops, right? Yeah. So how, any, any insight on, on how we fix that? I mean, I think we can't listen to stats that change when someone gets acquired. That's part yeah. of it. Um, but uh, I, I, honestly, I think we go with our gut. Yeah. I, I think we have to push there. I think it's there, and, and we have to go find it and pull it out, and just like diversity, right? They're, they're there, they're interested, and they're excited, and they're doing their own thing, and if we don't get in there and amplify them and pull them in and seek them out, like, they're going to do their own thing. They'll have different markets, they'll have different interests, but it, it's happening in video. I mean... It's hot and everywhere, so. Can I, can I add one thing too? I think that nobody understands the size, scope, and scale of an audience. And we're using, I think Rebecca said it best, right? It, it's so early, it's pre-chasm, it's pre-adopter state. And so to understand the size, scope, and scale of an opportunity, if you do things correctly with a long vision, unfortunately everyone has their short visions, uh, but with a long vision, you can't comprehend, just take, but the smallest country in the world, it's bigger than an audience of the biggest podcaster in America. If all you did was translate to Arabic and went into Dubai and knew the, the cultural critical life and business issues the way that we do English speaking life and business issues, there's plenty of money in Dubai by the way, you would be amazed how quickly you would build a community and an audience that you could monetize. And so I just want to make sure that people realize that you know, even when I started my podcast, I remember Gary told me, dude, you got to change your radio station with Gal Media, your, your sports blender to a podcast. I'm like, dude, there's too many podcasts. It was five years ago. Now I'm on the other side of the coin with everyone else saying, there's not enough podcasts. There's way too many people that aren't listening to them. Just pick an area and start there and keep growing. And I do not want to discourage people. India, imagine just English and every other language spoken. Well, they... they, they boomed in the past couple of years. Reliance, Geo, the, uh, the, the uh, cell network out there, put 4G and 5G phones in 300 people, million people's hands in the course of two years, right? People who didn't have cell phones, right? And now they have these tiny little Tic Tac phones that can still like get audio and they're using it for streaming radio and sometimes podcasts, like they're there. We got to build for them. We got to get over there and build for them. Yeah, a lot of times they didn't have internet, right? So their yeah. phone was their first connectivity point. And I, you know, our our scale point was Google and text. We should we got to turn that into audio because I think that's where you know even short form. You know, all the ancillary products you guys can come up with with your voice on your website by having audio articles instead of text articles. Uh, I think that's gonna be a big boom as well. In short form is killing it right now. Like we're, we're, everything says do clips of it to pull people in, right? Pull people into the bigger thing. They don't wanna digest your three hour podcast anymore. They need an entry point if that's what you wanna do. So like, yeah, I'm just real excited about all that yeah. stuff. 
We're going to uh, take questions in just a minute. So if you do have questions, uh, please let Tia know, and she'll come around with the microphone. But I just wanted to summarize kind of the conversation really quickly. Brian, if I'm hearing you clearly, it is, and Dave, just start doing it. Just start getting it out there, even if it's not perfect, even if you can't get that final 20% to make that authenticity perfect. If you start to transcreate and translate your content and put it out into these massive, massive listenership pools in India, LATAM, anywhere, it's going to at least spark sort of what the beginning of how we start to yeah. build global audiences. Would well, that be a fair summary? Yeah, but I want to add one more thing on there. Stop shitting on free podcast hosting and free tools, right? Like every time we tell somebody that Anchor sucks and they can't record on their phone and they're not building it in India or wherever, they're turning to TikTok. They're building their content somewhere else because they're more welcoming than us. They're the same tools. We need kids in school building podcasts with whatever tools they have and growing with the industry. And that's exactly, build it. Build it local, build it however you can to as many different places from whatever size you are. Yeah, I would say get started in synthetic voice as well. I mean, the tools are getting better. The authenticity is way better. You jump in the river now, and in six months to a year, you'll be further down the river. Um, just lost my thought. Well, that, I mean, no, but if you're the only yeah. energy drink, <laughs> but, right? right? Think about it. if you were the only energy right. drink, you're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever tasted. Now right. there's 50, but who's still there? The very first ones that created, you know, the sweet, tart yeah. tasting energy drink that mixed with vodka. S synthetic voice is now accessible on like a, a Per, per object transaction. Like, that's an inflection point we're at right now. It used to be contracts. It used to be things only big companies can afford. That's right. You can go individually turn an episode and you can try once. That's, that's, right. that's the cool part. And even advertisers. I mean, I think you would be surprised. Some advertisers are running completely synthetic campaigns. And, you, and you know, we have an agency that we, you know, we uh, attribute those very, it's performance-driven agency. There is zero drop in performance on a synthetic campaign to a real campaign. People wouldn't even know. You'd be surprised to find out some of these brands using synthetic. And that's easier to get to the extra 20%. If you're just creating the ad, you can really put the money in time. And so you have an English-speaking podcast going into Brazil, but your advertisement is specific to those intonations and connotations. It's genius. Yeah, I mean, and I could go on this forever, but the extreme localization, too. You could actually change the ad copy 27 times a day. You could be completely relevant to the local weather. You could be completely relevant to the international weather or whatever it might be, because you're not actually getting in a studio and voicing that, you're literally typing that out and you can market by market, country by country, uh, advertising will work better. That, uh, seeing that work in, from the streaming space when it was at Pandora and we were testing that and working along those lines, what Drew is saying in terms of that personalization of the ad goes a very, very long way. And I think that's why it's so important again for us to keep up, you know, and keep innovating in terms of technology in the space because we have to all work together in order to make this really successful. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I do want to get to some questions. I think it's a, a quiet enough room. If you just uh, kind of, you know, enunciate your voice, we'll be okay. Uh, let's just start here on the right. Yeah, so I, I have two businesses. One is a uh, voiceover services business that's global that has two languages, 87 different languages. So I found the exchange between Drew and Andy to be fascinating, right? Because I, when I look, look at what you're doing, Drew, I see amazing potential in terms of just building, you know, making this just explode worldwide from a podcasting perspective. But then, you know, some of the concerns that Andy brought up, I run across every day because I'm doing translation and um, uh, voice services primarily for telephone applications and on hold. So there is this kind of trade-off, and I wonder if there's I'd be interested in both individuals commenting. Do you think that there might be certain applications that would lend themselves better to, to an authentic or human voice and others that would uh, lend itself better to a more of an AI approach? I'll just go first, Andy. You sure? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think both win. So I think, you know, the synthetic, um, we're not here to put anybody out of business. I think we're here to create scale and to create opportunity. So there are gonna be moments for localization where synthetic voice might be great, it might be a shorter form, it might be a sweeper, it might be a, you know, a 10 second, or, you know, by the way, they can make money in their sleep too, but we can also put, uh, uh, create their voice in Japanese, so now it, it opens up a whole Japanese market for them. So we're here to create opportunity, we're not here to 
cut into their business. So we're just giving tools to create more revenue for folks. I think the uh, way we're thinking about it is how do we use both, right? And how do we think about extending, and again, from an audience development side, and it's, let's just take what we're doing here. We create um, short form for uh, publishers like Time, uh, The Economist, Fast Company, and 50 others. Um, to me, how do we start uh, by bringing somebody into a, a, a listening session uh, through human voice and through authentic voicing, and then if there's an opportunity to extend that time spent with more listening sessions through something that may be um, through AI, then that's how we're thinking about it. So it's almost like how do we take chocolate and peanut butter, put it together, and create the you know the Reese's peanut butter cup that way? Does anybody get that reference? Okay, four people, awesome. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, sorry, we have a lack of microphones. I'll restate the question in case you can't hear it. But yes, in the red, right here. Yeah, so um, it's a little bit off topic. So I'm Odile, I work for uh, OSHA, which is a hosting platform in France. I see a lot of effort pushing US voices out to the world. And I don't hear enough about how to bring international non-English voices into the US, which to me is much more interesting. Um, and like trends creating, uh, I also have 10 years in localization, trends creation. So trends creating, because if you bring Arabic podcasts, French podcasts, Portuguese podcasts into the US, then you have the talents to actually bring this authentic voice. Um, so just restating the question really quickly, we see a lot of translation services from English into other native languages. What about native languages into English so that those shows can build a US or global English listener base? Well, so we're, we're at the phase of podcasting where we're still focused on like the celebrity. Like, and that, that matters here. The name recognition matters here. But like, look at what Netflix is doing, right? Like, sure, they have some celebrity stuff, but uh, Squid Game, yeah. right? That's the next stage. We're, we're still a stage behind. We tend to ignore that all of this kind of works the same way, and so we're ignoring video right now. It's coming, and the companies that prioritize that will do well, but right now, we, we got a Boy Meets World rewatch podcast, which I enjoy very much, but that, that pulled me in. That still pulls me in. The content that could come from another country, I'm quick still as a podcast listener to assume that I can find someone who's English, based in, like with an English language, to... Um, uh, that can have the same content. There's, yeah, there's a lot of overlap on the same type of content, so we haven't yet nailed that. But it's it's coming, and the companies that prioritize that will hit a home run. The money's here in the U.S. We should be translating other languages into English and capitalizing on that. Yeah, and not ask the creators to pay 200k to have their shows, you know, like localizing the U.S. Oh, it's way cheaper now. Yeah, we talk we, to him. We are a global talk company. To him. Love think, to offer our yeah. services. It's not 200k. Uh, but I, I mean, like even Andy, I mean, 200k to, to localize the show is probably. Yeah, I we could do it for half. That's yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, the stripes right here. Thanks. Um, really enjoying this fascinating stuff. Um, I have a true crime podcast, Investigative. Um, two seasons out, I have over a million downloads. I've been downloaded in 100 countries. Um, so, and I'm just in English. So I'm fascinated by this idea. I'm also a returned Peace Corps volunteer, lived in the Ukraine, lived in South America, love the world. Um, tell me logistically, how would this work? Would I toggle languages in my feed? How would someone, you know, how would you see this, like as a listener, discover, hey, Final Days on Earth is now in 33 languages? So just quickly, how do you transcreate? How, logistically, how does that work? If you have a hit show in English, how do you even go about the transcreation, distribution, logistics of sharing that show with the world? It's, it's a separate feed. Because right now, you have to set the language on it. You can't select multi-language. You can't select the drop-down. One of the flaws of the open RSS aspect is unless all the aggregators agree to build something in or we add it to the feed and they all adopt it, like yours is a separate feed too, yeah, right? But I use a lot of post-production content because you can't just create an yeah. audience with a feed, right? Yeah, but so you, that's you a send real people good, over there. And then that drives them to yeah. the other feed. But you, 
I think you should survey your audience and you should ask them if this was localized to the language that you're hearing it in, right? And you can even target the ad effectively asking that. Would you share it with your friends? Would more people you interact with be interested in it? Because they're listening to it in those countries in English. Yeah, that, that's what I find so fascinating is they're not ask them. like English-speaking countries. Yeah. yeah, I mean, no doubt you would get a lift. I mean, I'm, I can't imagine you wouldn't. Um, and again, we're just the tech, so we would deliver the, the product to you and then, you know, you would distribute it. Cool, yeah, question right here. So how do you work on discoverability yeah. for those types of localized podcasts? Uh, yeah, they're not necessarily localized. Like how, uh, how can you break the discoverability for the podcasters uh, uh, for international when international knows only 100 shows? I, yeah. I, I want to... We actually, I think, all agree with you. Like, I don't, I think this, we're talking about tools and planning on that. Like, content is different than the tools to make it in a different language. You're right. If, uh, like, I create a podcast for a Danish audience in English, but it's about something relevant to a Danish audience, that can resonate as well as, you know, depending on the language, right? It, there's opportunity there. We're talking about extending reach and distribution on all that. But, I, I really been pushing back a lot this week. We don't have a distribution problem or a discovery problem, right? People find books, people find music, okay? The aggregators are starting to change to lead to what works best for them. Apple has an interest, Spotify has an interest, Google, Amazon, they all have interests in what they're promoting. It's a business now. You can't, you can't trip into becoming a successful podcast. You have to invest in it and get in front of your audience wherever they are. All right, I'm getting the uh, wrap it up. So I wanted to thank everyone for sticking around today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you so much for, for having this conversation, for talking about this topic. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure you know, folks will stick around. Uh, but thank you again. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.